Welcome to Corwin's Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast with host Peter DeWitt. This podcast is from education leaders for education leaders. Every week, Peter and our guests get together to share ideas, put research into practice, and ensure every student is learning, not by chance, but by design. Hey, Tanya, how are you? Hey, Peter. Uh, I, I believe that we're talking from an even further distance than we usually do. You're out in the field doing <laughs> the good work. Is that is that correct? It is. So for those of you that watch on YouTube, you're going to notice my space is a little bit different. I try to record these from home, from my home office, but I am in my hotel room in Seattle. So for I'm here for a couple of days doing some leadership work. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. But it's always good to, uh, I was looking forward to this conversation. So I know that people might think, I don't know, I think people will have a variety of feelings um, because we're interviewing Mike Soleil, the president of Corwin, which is part of SAGE. And um, when you and I talked, we were both purposeful in why we wanted to do this. It was not because it was gonna be a commercial for Corwin. Um, quite honestly, I've known Mike for 11 years. And when I think of leaders, um, he is definitely somebody that I see as a, is a leader that I look up to. He has been, and I talked to him a, a little bit about my personal examples when we're doing the podcast, but even during this time when you're hearing about book banning and, and the reason why we contacted him in the first place too is because we know that there are certain publishers that are kind of backing off on talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And Mike wanted to double down where that was concerned because he he sees it as a long term piece that we need to be able to focus on. So this conversation is really about all of that plus a little bit of you know John Hattie news because John's a huge part of of the Corwin family. So I really um, I'm I hope people will listen to this and not just listen to it as well he's not a school principal or he's not a school superintendent or he's not a teacher. The reality is I think he has a lot of um, very good insight for us as far as what it means to be a leader during very difficult times. Yeah, I think the the things that he talks about are certainly transferable. I mean, there are always a set of leadership skills that are transferable to all leaders, but Mike is still closer to leaders in schools because of the content of his work. So I, I certainly found the talk highly relevant. And you know, and, and listening to him, it reminded me, I believe Maya Angelou had said that of all the important traits or characteristics, that courage is the first and most important one because it's the one that's needed almost always before you take the next step mm -hmm. or you do something else. Um, it's a precursor trait, if you will. So I think not only does Mike embody that, but he also is going to give listeners some real guideposts to kind of drive their decision making and how to just, you know, um, not just survive, but thrive during this, uh, you know, 2022 and gives a real hope for 2023. So I think listeners are going to really enjoy it. Yes. So uh, happy listening, as we say. Happy listening. Mike Soule, welcome to the Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast. Thanks, Peter. It's great to be here. <laughs> I have to admit, this is a, this is a different interview for me because you, of course, are the president of Corwin, and I just feel like you know over the past year or so, you and I have talked in in a variety of spaces and talked about a lot of things like leadership and even the complications with publishing, and we know that there are things like book banning, and I just really appreciate that you were able and, and agreed to, uh, to coming on to the, the podcast so we could talk a little bit about it. What Tanya and I usually like to do is start off um, every podcast with developing sort of a common language and a common understanding. And one of the things that I want to ask you about is leadership. When you think about leadership, because you are very much a leader, um, when you think about leadership, what's the common understanding you would want people to have around that term? Gosh, could you start with a simpler question? Um, first off, <laughs> Peter, thank you very much for inviting me. And, um, you know, kind of shocked that you were actually able to book me. Nobody nobody does. So it's, um, you know, rare. Um, but uh, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, <laughs> leadership is, um, is actually very difficult um, in the sense that um, if you take it seriously, you, you really are thinking about... Um, 
everyone in the organization and um, wanting to provide context in terms of where it is as an organization that you're trying to do. Um, and so for me, it's about setting a vision for um, where we're trying to go as an organization, not just in um, the next couple of months, but in the next couple of years, and then providing context so that everyone understands um, what role they play in that and um, inviting them to um, challenge that vision as well. Um, because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, companies are made up of people and um, people who are trying to strive to do the absolute best. And so uh, for me, I, I always keep in mind that everyone shows up, whether it's uh, in the old days when we came into offices uh, or these days when we show up in these boxes on video, um, wanting to do the absolute best. And so how do we equip them to do the absolute best and um, provide them with a vision and a, a guidepost for where we go? I'm not sure if that answered your question. No, it, it, it does, actually. And I feel like when you talk, there are so many things that I want to, you know, I want to talk to you about. Number one is how did COVID impact that? Um, because publishing, we know, I mean, everybody sort of had a hard stop and then try to figure out where to go next. How did COVID impact you as a leader with what you were trying to do? I think, you know, um, I'm certain much like, you know, any movie that we see these, you know, that sort of begins with um, December 5th uh, in the 1940s, you know, you know that something's going to happen or um, uh, 910 uh, before 911, right? The same thing, March 2020, all of us um, are going to start these stories, which is uh, we were having a leadership conference and talking about what we were going to do for 2020 and 2021. Um, and this COVID thing was happening. And, and like everyone said, you know, be over in about three weeks. It wasn't. Um, and so what ended up happening, uh, and I think what has been very helpful, is we, made to ha we had to make really hard decisions very quickly. Mm -hmm. We had an existential threat, meaning no one was going to buy books and no one was booking face-to-face -face training in terms of professional development because they were dealing with far more important issues, which was making sure that they could figure out how to open schools safely and how to take care of kids uh, and bring the adults back into the system. So everything stopped for us. And so we had to stop ourselves and say, what do we want to do as a company? Um, and there was no sort of uh, niceties about it. I think what it forced us to do was to confront um, any third rail issue that may have been in an organization in the past and really kind of say, let's be honest, what has the most impact? What are we going to do that is going to um, help keep us alive as a company, but also is going to be most meaningful in terms of the customers that we serve? And so it really focused us um, in a way that um, we could never have done in the past. And um, I keep challenging our group to continue to have 2020 thinking as opposed to 2019 thinking as we move into what we're doing for 23 and 24 and 25 and beyond. How would, would you say, no, I'm going to ask it another way. How has the past two years made you a better leader? Oh, I think it's made me more honest. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, and I, I say that in the sense of, uh, not that I wasn't honest in the past, um, I'm a consensus builder. Mm -hmm. So um, I tend to take more time in terms of building a coalition around ideas and thinking and things. Um, we didn't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I know what it is that I think we should be doing, uh, I feel much more um, empowered to just say, no, this is what we're gonna do mm -hmm. and let's move forward. Again taking into consideration, of course, everybody's ideas. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I've been at this for a very, very long time and I know where we're going and what we need to do. And so I, I think that's the piece. I guess it's kind of shortcutted um, uh, the, um, my decision-making in a way in a, it, that's been very, very positive, I think, for the organization. You know, one, so we saw each other in July for the Visible Learning Conference and one thing I've always appreciated about you, and it's one of the reasons why I always publish with Corwin, this is not going to be some commercial for Corwin, but one of the reasons why I've always published with you is you've had a, a 
pretty deep stance when it comes to things like equity. I mean, I've, you know, I've said this to you many times before, but, you know, when I was a brand new author and just did my dissertation on safeguarding LGBT students and Arnas Berbikovs, our former editor, um, said, I want you to publish a book on that. And I remember just after the book published, you, you stood up at a Corbin event and started talking about it. And it was amazing to me because even though back then, 11 years ago, people would have looked at safeguarding LGBTQ students as like not a big topic, like this is just something we should be doing. I remember it just being awe-inspiring that you would do something like that. And over the years, I've seen you do that so many times. And when we were together in July, you got up on stage and you were talking about equity. What is, how do you navigate your way through this very political world that we seem to be in when it comes to publishing books on equity, because that's something that you've always been behind. And I see that there are other publishers, you hear stories about other publishers that are trying to back off on publishing work around equity, and you're not, you're just, you're moving forward with it, which I think is one I want to thank you for, because I think it's important, but how do you navigate this political space when there are words like equity that seem to be outlawed in states? Um, we're in a place and time where people have to make choices mm -hmm. around things. And um, once again, stand up for what it is that we or they believe in. One of the wonderful things about um, Sage Publishing, who is um, the parent company of, of Corwin, um, is uh, Sarah Miller McCune has always believed in social justice and the work um, that's there in terms of all the justices. Um, and I have fundamentally believed in the 13 years that I've been with Corwin that we continue the legacy of the work that we've done over 30 plus years of publishing um, the best voices in whatever area that there is. But one of the most important areas is in equity and the work that we do there. It is under attack in a number of places, um, but we will not um, step back. We will double down. We will triple down in terms of the work that we're doing because we know that we're on the right side of history in terms of what it is that we're doing. Uh, no one has ever celebrated uh, backsliding in terms of what it is that our people's rights, their dignity, and being able to appear in their workplace or in their classroom in the fullness of who they are. Mm -hmm. So if we can do any little bit that helps move that forward, in terms of giving people the evidence base that they need, in terms of giving them the words that they need, in terms of giving them a framework that they need to think about disproportionality, to think about what it is that we're trying to accomplish, because schools are the cornerstone of a just and thriving society. Where else but here? Where else but with teachers and educators in terms of the work that we do? So we are passionately dedicated to this work and um, we take it very, very seriously. Some of our books have already been on band lists. Um, and um, as far as I'm concerned, that'll be short term. And we will keep striving in terms of the work that we do. Uh, the work that you did 11 years ago was incredibly important. It began to give educators an understanding of children that they had not been dealing with but didn't know how to deal with in the past. And so we'll continue to be on the vanguard of the work that we're doing. And uh, I'm incredibly proud of our authors, uh, of the work that we do, and of our dedication to this particular area. Thank you. So uh, I wanna switch gears a, a little bit um, because you are the president of publishing and so you make all the big decisions and everybody who's listening who would like to publish books, uh, Tanya, Morgan Fox and I, actually did a podcast interview about what it's like to try to write for the leadership line and, and what we look for. So I want to switch gears a little bit. And what do you look for in books? Like when you, when Corwin's going to be publishing something, what are you looking for? Is there, is there any sort of, um, I don't want to say recipe, but 
How do you know when you look and say, wow, that is a book we need to be able to publish? Yeah, you know, when I first got hired, um, I made the joke, do I have to actually read in this job? And, <laughs> and the, 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 the answer was- a sense of humor that I yeah, <laughs> The answer was, yeah, you have to read. Um, you know, what do we look for? Uh, here's, here's the thing. Uh, for anyone out there that's, that's thinking about this, um, look very carefully at that table of contents to begin. What do each one of those chapters do and how do they build one upon the other in terms of the story that you're trying to tell and um, the message that you're trying to get out? And then I think the other part is being um, really brutally honest with yourself around um, who the audience is that you are wanting to um, serve. Everybody wants to say, oh, it's for everyone. In most cases, it's not for everyone. Um, it's for a very specific audience. And sometimes that's okay. Um, and so that's what we're looking at in, in terms of, is there a clear voice? Um, I think that's the hardest thing for authors to um, uh, develop over time is what is their voice, right? You've developed a voice. Um, you can read something and it's a Peter DeWitt um, title in terms of what it is that you're doing. Same thing with, you know, a whole host of folks that, that I could um, mention. So I think it's, um, it's that. What's your voice? What is it that you're trying to do in terms of your message? Who are you trying to impact? And how are you advancing whatever the discipline is that you're in? Um, because what we don't need is a rehash of history, right? A little bit of it is good for context setting, but where are we trying to move the discipline or the area? Those are the things that we look at. Um, and that's what gets us excited about um, in terms of uh, titles that, that we wanna publish. You know, we have a we have a lot of listeners that are leaders, teachers, and they might be thinking, okay, so Mike is a leader of a of a publishing company. Um, what do you want? How do you want to help teachers and leaders? Like, what advice can you offer to them? We know that I've heard about things like quiet quitting. Um, I've heard about you know the teacher shortage. We hear about um, we know stress and anxiety. Is, is a really huge deal for, for educators. How are you, what advice can you offer to them? And how are you trying to help them right now by you know, the books that Corwin could be publishing or the webinars that you're offering or, or anything like that? I think the, um, in the 30 plus years um, that I've been working in this, um, in this space, I, I've never seen an environment like the one that we're in right now mm -hmm. in terms of just people feeling tired. Um, and so I would say to the leaders that are in organizations, take a deep breath mm -hmm. and um, just love on your team. Uh, you know, give them the support that they need right now. And, and that's what we're hearing from so many people is for this particular year, we don't wanna take on a lot of new initiative. We just need to take a breath and a pause and then 2023, we'll be back and we'll be hitting at it. Um, we're gonna be onboarding um, you know, almost a third of uh, a new team in the US, particularly in terms of educators coming into these um, schools. And so what we're gonna need is really um, very solid evidence-based uh, training programs that are going to help support those teachers. While you know we are known as the premier publisher in professional development, many people don't realize we are a full professional learning organization. And so we do that training. And so what we develop uh, along with um, our colleagues, especially with John Hattie and the visible learning work is real solid evidence-based work that is the blocking and tackling in terms of what it is that you need to do in your classroom that will give you the language that you need for learning, but also the instructional moves that are gonna be necessary in terms of what it are, whatever it is the context is that you're dealing with. Um, and that's complex, but it is important in terms of what it is that um, new teachers and veteran teachers are, are gonna need right now uh, in terms of, uh, of where they are and, and the context of, of what's happening. 
They don't need, you know, sort of fancy new uh, initiatives. What they need is really smart tools to understand uh, what it is that they've got in front of them in terms of their kids and um, the kind of training that's going to help them really share a learning language with their students so that they can measure their impact and understand that if you haven't taught it, then they haven't learned it. So how, how do you own that as a teacher? Uh, but also, how do you make sure that uh, every student that you have um, is, a, uh, is owning their own learning and knows what to do when they don't know what to do? If we can get there in terms of teachers understanding their impact and what that means and can measure it and students knowing what to do when they don't know what to do, uh, I think we'll be in a really, really good place um, as we move forward. Yeah, so I have one more question about that. I'm glad you mentioned John Hattie. Um, John has had an enormous impact on what I do, my life, everything. What is, uh, what is the partnership with John meant to you? Oh, well, you know, that's multidimensional. Um, from a... Um, a company perspective, a professional company perspective, the fact that John um, wanted to partner with Corwin and bring his life work to us validated um, who we are as an organization in the sense of the seriousness with which he takes professional learning um, and the seriousness which, with which he does his work. And so the fact that he saw us as an organization that could help him scale that work globally um, was a real credit to um, to to us. I, I don't mean that in a braggy way. I mean that in a sense of that was a huge accomplishment um, for us in terms of what it is that we believe and and how we do our work. I will say that John has challenged me and my thinking around professional learning um, enormously, and. Um, I'm still learning every day. I was with him all last week and um, I, I still go, oh, geez, I didn't know what I didn't know mm -hmm. um, in terms of what it is that he challenges us on. So it's a, um, John means everything to us. He pushes us in our thinking. Um, you know, probably a third of what we publish now is based on the visible learning work. Um, we will be announcing a huge new um, redesign of our professional learning with visible learning at the middle of it. And um, I'll announce here, I'll make a little a news for you. I was going to say, Mike, you can't be on this podcast and not. I got some news. <laughs> I got some news for you right now. I'm going to give you some news, which is we are uh, have just finished a, a global Delphi study with John okay. on equities, identity and belonging. And one of the criticisms that John has had is, you know, you're always just looking at student achievement. You're not looking at the soft skills, right? Well, we've now got 10 mind frames on equity, identity, and belonging, which will be um, coming out in the next month or so. Um, and not only a, a book, but um, several uh, set suites of training around that, which are going to be groundbreaking. And the fact that John is leading that charge along with Corwin, uh, you know, I'm just incredibly proud. That's awesome. Well, thank you for yeah, at least giving us that news here, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> just for you, my friend. <laughs> well, Mike, uh, you know, one of the things you talk about a lot is courage. And I, I have to admit that you've always been a courageous leader, you know, in the 11 or 12 years that I've known you, because even during the toughest of times, you know what the important work is and you keep looking forward. And I know a lot of us deeply appreciate that. So on behalf of Tanya, my counterpart for the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be on this. Well, Peter, thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation. I, um, I appreciate it very, very much more than you know. And um, I am uh, thrilled that we got a chance to just spend a couple of minutes together and, uh, and see your, your handsome face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, feeling, the feeling's mutual. Thank you. Good. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Oh, Mike, that was, that was, I think, as good as we really thought it was going to be. Mike brought a new lens and angle to this work of leadership, but remained highly relevant and, and I think left leaders with some real ways that they can 
maybe go back into their practice with some fresh eyes and some strength, you know, the, you know, what it takes to just continue to persevere, because I think we always need a reminder and, and, a, and a dose of that in, in, in complicated journeys like school leadership. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. And and the thing is, it, you know, it's funny when I watch body language because when I moderate a chat or whatever, I'm always yeah. looking at body language. And Mike can be very humorous. I mean, mm-hmm. we both have been with him um, at events, and he's just he's got an incredible sense of humor. Yeah. But then when I started talking about things like equity and book banning, he, you just saw him lean in, and and um, he was pretty adamant about that. And I think what's important too is that we often will look at COVID and how it impacted us, you know, as teachers or as leaders, but make no mistake, COVID impacted publishers in a very, very big way. And I wanted to be able to talk about that. Um, And also, I think it's important to acknowledge and honor the relationship that he has with with Hattie as well. You know, for for many people, not just those who write for Corwin, um, John has had an enormous impact on what yeah. they do. So just being able to talk about that is really important too. And, and he was very, very lucky that he actually made that announcement with us because I would have been very annoyed if he said, and yeah. the it's coming soon. And then he didn't, <laughs> and didn't tell anymore. us. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't tease. Yeah. That's, that's uh, again, one of the, one of Mike's strengths is, you know, he really tries to be considerate and give people <laughs> enough of what they need and not drive them crazy, especially during a year of the pandemic. So um, yeah, I'm glad he, he was able to to tell us enough about this new uh, initiative. And it sounds like a really, really exciting one. Yeah, well, you know, that was, uh, I do a lot of interviews, but that one was was very important for me just because yeah. it, it really was an amazing experience, not to get too personal, but, you know, when you do, a, when you do your dissertation in, in, in safeguarding LGBTQ students, and then your editor says that's going to be your first book. There are yeah. feelings that go along yeah. with that because sometimes when you're writing a book on the topic, is that the only topic that you're going to be able to write about? And there are so many things that I wanted to be able to focus on. But I remember being at this Corwin event and like we're talking Michael Fullen, all these people were there. And Mike got up on stage and said, I want to talk about one book. And he started talking about mine and like nobody knew mm. who I was. Yeah. And I remember just feeling this overwhelming sense of gratitude because mm. as somebody who nobody knew, you yeah. know, I'm still a school principal, I had been writing for Ed Week for maybe like a few months. But for that to happen, it made me realize what kind of focus that Mike wanted to be able to have because he was brand new. Mm-hmm. He had only started. I mean, I think he had started like a year before that or something. Yeah. Um, and it showed what kind of focus that he wanted to have on inclusionary topics. Mm-hmm. And he hasn't let that go. In fact, I think he's, you know, he talked about streamlining, but also um, I think it's just an area of passion for him that he thinks mm-hmm. is really important for everybody in order for all of us to be more human together. And so I'm glad that we got into that. And it was just, for me, it was a really great conversation to have. Yeah, gosh, and listening to you just really reminds me of the impact it had for you to be seen in that moment mm-hmm. with all of your accomplishments and everything you already had going for you by that time. Imagine the impact on our students yeah. um, where sometimes this is the first place that they get seen is, yeah. is with a teacher or can be. Um, so Ah, heavy and great stuff all around. Um, yeah. I feel like I've got some real food for thought myself. So um, listeners, as always, we really enjoy learning alongside of you. Um, and we really, really hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. Yes. And thank you to everybody for listening. And Tanya, until next time. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, have a good one. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, so that ends it. And how is Seattle going? Uh, I just got here last night at six o'clock. And uh, the guy I work with, this is the long term work. So it's Mm -hmm. um, part of my lead advisor work. So yeah, it's uh, went to dinner with one of the guys that I work with Jenny Donna, who's coming in. Oh, okay. I know. Delayed. So she's, I think she's coming in today. She was supposed to come in last night. Yeah. Um, But no, I'm here until I leave Friday morning. And okay, just a few days. Yeah, it's just a few days, but I love coming here. It's absolutely Seattle is just like great.
gorgeous. And, yeah, you've uh, been you said that the last time. I'm gonna put that on my you know my bucket is. list, yeah, my really, United States bucket list. Yeah, it's just such a nice. There's just such a cool feeling when you come here, and so. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right, Peter. So until we talk again. Yes, Tanya. Good to see you. You too. All right. Bye. Have a good one. Bye.